The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Just yeah. Okay, we're going to get um, today we've got the pleasure of two local game developers uh, here to talk to us about uh, some of their work. Um, we've got Glenn, and I don't have your last names in front of me right now. Given. Glenn, Glenn Given. Given uh, from Games by Playdate, um, and you're located in New Hampshire? Yes. Well, two-thirds of us are. It's like a three-person studio. Um, two of us in New Hampshire, one of, one of us is in um, Drake It. So. Um, then we can board games and card games. Yes, a lot of them. And then Matt, can I also don't know your last name? Kenzie Cameron. Kenzie Cameron. Um, and he's uh, one of the co-organizers from the from the Game Makers Guild, uh, a local meetup um, that meets up at the various places around Cambridge, around uh, the Cambridge area, uh, for people who are interested in developing board games and card games and meet each other and learn more about how to make them. So I guess we're uh, each year going to go um, just plan for the Mac. Um, talk a little bit about what you do, about this kind of work you do, um, and then afterwards we're going to open up for questions. Sure. Um, so I, I, I just, I make games, I make board games and make card games, um, and I try and never stop doing them. I don't have a particular, like, anything that I could play that I could make happen, I'll, I'll do it, you know, like. We do uh, party games. So, like, I just got 2,500 copies of my first party game delivered to my house like three hours ago, which is interesting, moving those myself and then getting here. Um, but I also am developing a gigantic stupid board game that's just called a Big Dumb War Game, which is like, um, do you guys ever play like Axis and Allies or any of those old? So I used to play that uh, when I was in high school because I liked being lonely. And then... Um, <laughs> I decided I want to make a version of that that's actually fun. Uh, we're also working on a game called Pack the Pack, which is a, um, you guys know Cards Against Humanity? Right? Okay, so they're running this contest called the Cards Against Humanity Tabletop Deathmatch. And it's, they, they got indie developers from all over the country uh, to submit stuff. And so one of our games is in that, um, which will be, it, it's like a, if you ever played old Diablo, remember when you would collect loot and you'd have to fit it in your bag and it was all weird shaped? So it's an inventory Tetris game uh, where everyone is pulling tiles, which are effectively dominoes with different images on them, and then you're, you're aligning them to make gems. So it's like an analog version of Super Puzzle Fighter. Um, and the way, I, but this is more to the point, like everything I've just described to you doesn't tell you anything about the games except in reference to other games that uh, I've talked about. But um, that's kind of how I do design. I look at, I look at games that I like and then I um, vivisect them and take the parts that I want and then, and then put them back together with other parts and see if there's a thing that goes with it. But yeah, also uh, I did printing and publishing for 10 years um, and then that drove me madder than normal. So I left that to do this. Um, so I very, very rapidly, me and my team very rapidly design games. We, we, we bring a design all the way to a publishing level in about a month from conception to execution. Um, they're not these huge endeavors, but um, it's good to kind of stay really busy with it and exercise with it and realize that sometimes a project is gonna fail and you can back away from it and go, ah, well that month is kind of a bust. And so we're actually also exploring different kind of business models for board games because this isn't really a hugely there's very few people who are going to be very wealthy on it or even do good on it. Um, even people Scare who them off, right? Yeah, <laughs> seriously. So like maybe you make the next Settlers of Catan and, and then you're selling a SETI like 5,000 copies a year, which is not that much for anything of it. Um, depending on the, the way your business is set up, you may see a fraction of that money. So like that's why a lot of um, very, very good designers, like um, I'm a big fan of uh, Bruno Faduti, who just came out with Masquerade, which is like a... Masquerade's great. Masquerade's a really cool game. Citadels is the one that most of them would know. Yeah. Uh, so he, he'll he churn out, not churn out, he'll put out a couple of games and then he just gets kind of a 
I capture from each of them. Um, but we directly, using short run printing, um, we directly manufacture kind of our monthly games. Uh, and then people are, people subscribe to us um, through stuff like Patreon. And, uh, and then we just, we send them physical copies of the games that we make. And I, I brought up like nine different games that I made in the past six months. Uh, so That's good, I didn't bring any. Yeah, well you can borrow some of mine, because they're, they're, and then the, you can borrow the bad ones. Um, and then also we go to Kickstarter for larger uh, games, ones where we want to make like multi-thousand copies of it. Um, but the board, yeah, I, I, I will never stop talking. Good. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, board, board games are really awesome. I think that you guys know that. Um, and they're more awesome now than, than they used to be, not just because they're more complicated, right? Because complexity isn't what makes a game really good. In fact, usually a really complex game is really bad because it's a sign that there was a huge problem and that the designer said, oh, I know how to fix this. I'll add another page to the rule book. That's, that's <laughs> poor planning. But, um, but games are better now because people want them more. And the reason, I mean, what I think, the reason people want them more is because we crave physical analog time with other people now, more so than, more so than when I was a kid. Um, because we're super interconnected, you know, with smartphones and all that stuff that we can't live our life without. Like I'm Twittering all the way down here doing 80 on the highway because I'm a bad person. But uh, the ability to say, okay, I I've been staring at these screens all day long and my entire life is scheduled. I need to have some, I need to schedule my relaxing time and it needs to not be me staring at a screen. So I, I think there's something in the zeitgeist of that personal feeling that, that people had that, that has caused a resurgence in face-to-face in -face gaming. Um, yeah, because even like like apps and stuff, I will straight up just hands down beat anyone that plays the Race for the Galaxy app if I'm playing them face to face because the the skills that you need are completely different. And there's really? things that board games do really yeah, well yeah. that you don't find in other mediums. So like I play a ton of Netrunner, which is a really awesome <laughs> game. Rulebook on that is awful. The rulebook is the worst. <laughs> but and but some people have hacked together. Uh, there's a program called Octagon, which is like a virtual tabletop where you can basically simulate any game that's been made. What I mean is a whole interesting other discussion of how do you do internet piracy of, vi of board games? <laughs> that could be a class. Um, <laughs> it's good. That'd be a good idea for class. Anyway, so Octagon's really neat. Except one of the things about Netrunner, is that if you've played it, raise your Raise your hand, so I know that, okay. Is the original version count? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Although the new version is better, and you should totally get back into the new version. It's amazing. Um, so uh, it, it has some, it's by the same guy who designed Magic the Gathering, and it has some sil similarities to that. Um, but what makes it really neat is that it's kind of an asymmetrical game. Like, um, I'll be an evil corporation, for instance, and uh, you might be a scrappy computer hacker, and you're trying to infiltrate my servers which are represented by my deck of cards, my hand of cards, my discard pile of cards, or like other things that I've installed, and find what my nefarious plans are, right? And you get all these crazy programs that allow you to circumnavigate my defenses. And I get all these programs that allow me to put down defenses, or maybe I get a card that says I orbitally bombard your, your <laughs> apartment building, which is always fun. Um, but a huge part of that game, although you can play it on Octagon, a, a tremendous part of that game is um, is bluffing uh, because it's it's what makes the game really rich is the hidden info not just that it's asymmetrical but there's a huge component of hidden information like as a corporation in that game everything I do I do by placing my cards face down so I know what they are but you don't and you have to like you know start to count cards a little bit or like start to make educated guesses about what you can you know can I run into can I can I can I attack his hand um, even though I have no offensive capabilities here, uh, is that going to mean that he explodes like a thing in my brain and my, my computer hacker dies or, you know, there's, there, there's all that. So a lot of that game is, um, called, is about managing what's called tilt, which is, um, something you get in poker. Uh, when you start, if you play poker, when you start losing poker, 
Uh, if you forget that poker is, a, is kind of a long game and that you should really be playing it with an eye on what the rest of your week looks like as opposed to this hand, you'll start to play worse because you're doing worse and you'll just tilt. Down, 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 down. So it's kind of like a tell, but it's, it's almost, it, it's more than just saying like, oh, I've got a bad card in my hand. It's going, I'm losing, so I need to play harder, which would be great if it was handball or something, but in a card game, that's a really, <laughs> like that doesn't work, because really what you want to do is, is establish um, regularity in what you're doing, uh, especially a game that's, that's that kind of mathematically perfect. I'm going to go ahead and introduce myself. Yeah. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know where I, I am. Yeah, right. uh, so my name is Mackenzie Cameron. I'm an uh, event coordinator for the Game Makers Guild. Um, so we host a lot of events, um, which if you guys, if you have any games in any level of prototype, whether it's nearly finished or uh, you just, you know, you scrape down something on a napkin and you're like, it might play, maybe I'll grab some dice or whatever. Uh, we accept that, um, which you'll check out our site. Um, it's meetup slash Game Makers Guild. Oh, actually, we just recently got the GameMakersGuild.com, so you can go to that website. Oh, that's a coup. Which I'm slowly we'll trying. Out to that. You know, you know Sweet. I'm slowly trying to make sure that we build copy for that. Is it ambitious, uh, or is it just Game Makers Guild only? GameMakersGuild.com, which is awesome. I don't know how we managed to get that without somebody else already having it. Um, but I host a lot of uh, some of the other events that we host. We have like just the standard play testing, but we also do like indie board game uh, event, uh, showcases. Actually, um, I've hosted that in Brookline three times now, uh, where we just get anyone that has like a cool design, submit your designs, and then we try and bring it out to the public. And then let's see other stuff that I do. I try to get my hand in everything board game related in Boston. Uh, I help out at Night Moves, the board game cafe out in Brookline which is a lot of fun. Uh, if you guys don't know about it, it's a, uh, you pay 10 bucks, you get in, they have in a library of something like 700 games and you can play for as long as you like with anybody that's around. Uh, I also do a board game themed web comic, overboard-comic.com. Um, and then, oh, there's one more thing. Oh, I'm gonna be uh, doing a panel at PAX this year. Uh, me and five other folks are gonna be talking about board game language. Um, which should be pretty interesting. It's a talk like a board game geek. If anyone's going to PAX, who's going to PAX? Ah, not as many of you. You should totally go. It's like the best thing. It's the reason I moved to Boston. Um, and then in the sort of distant future, uh, I've got a plans for my sort of uh, maiden voyage into Kickstarter called Killer Croquet, which is a uh, croquet-based murder simulator. Uh, that'll be a board game. And it's amazing. And I'm kind of on, uh, not, as, uh, not to say that Glenn is wrong about anything, but I'm doing the uh, <laughs> sort of one idea, build it up, um, do the Kickstarter sort of thing. The rapid iteration is yeah. really important. Yeah. Uh, but there's definitely lots of different paths towards making a board game and having it be successful. I think the main difference is that he has another job. Oh, yeah. And I don't. That's, that's true. I do this, I do this uh, for no money at all. Which yeah, is I do this for no money too, except that's a problem. Uh, yeah. And so rapid iteration. Uh, but you know, I, do you want to talk about like how you how you went from uh, game idea to like the prototype? Sure. I mean, do do we want to let them ask questions? Uh, so we're going to talk about. Would you like to know about your process? Yeah. And then the next question is going to be about funding. Okay. So so process. process. Uh, Mine is definitely, I mean, rapid iteration, but I've just kind of finally settled on one idea that I actually want to push forward, uh, rather than trying to uh, fund lots of small ideas, get the one big one. Um, I think the main difference of that is that I'm hoping that with that one idea, I'll be able to kind of use momentum to um, generally generate more funding for the general brand name of my design studio. Uh, but the uh, coming up with that idea is definitely a rapid iteration process where you come up with a very like sketchy idea. Uh, some players, some designers start with a mechanic, so they're like, oh, I want to do something with deck building, or build decks over the course of the game, which makes an engine that you then draw to then do other cool things. And then other players, no, other designers, myself, I'm usually like this, uh, start with some sort of system or some sort of theme, in my case, croquet. Uh, and see if you can turn that into a board game by adding different mechanics and seeing what works and what doesn't. Um, which the Game Makers Guild is pretty fantastic for that because when you get a game and you design it and on your first like first playthrough you look at your game and you be like this is amazing this is gonna work and you try and tell someone about it and you try and have them play it 
and uh, that doesn't always work so well. It uh, never works. It never works, Ever. actually. The first uh, time you put your thing down on the table, it's, um, it's just going to maybe burst into flames. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> a best case scenario is it bursts into flames, and you, you made some <laughs> mistakes, and it's basically unplayable because uh, you know you need dice, and you realize that when you roll the dice, the numbers always add up to some combination of factors that when you apply that to the system, it's like, oh, well, you're supposed to only move one space, but every time you do this, you actually just die immediately. Yeah, so people can, like, like break, break the, game, the game mechanically. Right? So you, yeah, you get, like, a top, to find a tautology element in it and just repeatedly. Uh, but the worst, one of the, like, the worst things that you can do, I had a game that I was developing for a while. Um, I pitched it to Game Salute, and it was a semi-cooperative game. So the idea was that all players have to work together so that everybody doesn't lose. But then once you kind of reach a certain threshold, only one player can win. And kind of a difficult concept to really balance well, but I managed to kind of really finagle it and get it working. And a bunch of my playtesters played it, and it worked out exactly the way I wanted to. They play it to a certain point, and then they turn on each other, and then there's a sort of big climactic battle, and it was fantastic. I you was know, watching just the mechanically of how it works. And then I asked them, you know, all right, it seemed, it seemed to work out really well. How'd you guys enjoy it? And they said, it was awful. I said, but it worked. It, it, like, you guys functioned in a way that was very functional. I was getting, yeah, but it wasn't fun. Which is d something that, uh, you know, when you realize as a designer, you're putting stuff together that the things that you necessarily think are kind of <coughs> interesting, or even if they're working, don't necessarily come across as fun. So that's actually really interesting. They, they finished the game. Mm -hmm. They didn't like playing the game, yet they still played the game. Yes. So how do you, like... Is that common when you're doing playtests? And how, uh, when there's whips involved. You, yeah, change. usually, like if you're, especially if it's in a dedicated playtesting group, and especially in the Game Makers Guild where it's primarily designers, right? Um, that has its own downsides to it. Uh, but yeah, they'll they'll see it through. I mean, they'll go Sisyphus on it, push that boulder all the way up, uh, just to see. You know, I mean, even when we found stuff that that is completely broken in a game. Like, I was playing a game where it was about, like, uh, robots rising up against humans or something, and there's this whole propaganda element, and then in the first few turns we had identified that if you just went to this one space on the board and continued to buy propaganda posters, you could shut every other player out of the game. And so it was just, I'm going to go there, I'm not going to move, I'm just going to keep doing this for the entire game until I win. And at that point, you could be like, okay, I don't want to play this game anymore. This is dumb. But we just did it for a half hour as different people tried different things using the rule set to unseat uh, that, that bad decision. So sometimes, even when you identify something that's broken, uh, it just gives you a new wound to start poking at uh, to see, like, what well, does this hurt? Yeah. No, like, like a doctor. That's how well, doctors work. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Stab you. Well, it's funny because you're at that doctor's game. And you're at the doctor's game. Yeah. <laughs> Sawbones. Sawbones, that's right. Um, encouraging playtesters to kind of finish a game can be an art in and of itself. Um, oftentimes, when you get designers that think that they can uh, fix your game for you, it'll be hard pressed to get them to finish your game because they're like, no, 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 this doesn't work, you should do it like this. But trying to urge your playtesters, we actually uh, had an event where we brought somebody in who was an expert on uh, generating playtest feedback, actually for video games, but she did a lot of paper prototyping, so it carried over. Um, and oftentimes it's just trying to encourage players to go all the way through because uh, sometimes even as players, even with published games, you'll play a game and like in the first playthrough you'll be like, oh, this, this one strategy is completely broken. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the uh, card game Race for the Galaxy. Uh, maybe a, a couple. Uh, but there's one particular strategy in it where uh, the first time you play through, there's the military strategy where if you have a certain level of military, you can play a lot of cards roughly for free, which is based on the mechanics. And almost everybody that plays the game for the first time realizes, like, oh man, military is such a great strategy. Like, how did they, like, make this game? And then the second time you play through, two players try and use that strategy, and a third player does a different strategy, and all of a sudden, that's the strategy that's overpowered. And oftentimes, because the game doesn't completely lay itself out in front of all the players in the first playtest, that um, the perception that it's broken is not always necessarily true. Yeah. And you can't find that kind of stuff until you've play tested it a really long time. Um, Question? Or, uh, I was just sort of, uh, I think the mentor example of that is Tolkien, where you get oh, yeah. people posting stuff like, oh man, this strategy is so overpowered. Like, this person scored like 70 points with it, and none of us scored above like 40 or so. 
you're, and then you respond like, ah, oh, seven. Yeah. Um, try 180 points. Yeah. One. Well, there's always stuff like that. I, th I think that's another, that, that illuminates another interesting thing about playtesting. Um, the, the group that you're playtesting with really can make a huge difference. Not just, is this person a designer or is this person not a designer, but, but how deeply they want to get into mastering that, that system or how much they care about mastering that system. Um, yeah, because we offer, I mean, multiple tiers of playtesting at the Game Makers Guild. We have like just the standard where you come in, you play with a bunch of designers, and they tell you it's crap. And you go home and you cry, and then you make it a little bit better, and you feel a little better. But then there's also, we have intensive playtesting, which is sort of phase two after you get a certain number of, you have a nomination and curation system, we're trying to set up a seal, Game Makers seal of approval, uh, so that we can hopefully better pitch the, our games to designers and the general public. But the phase two uh, intensives is the chance where you get the same group of people together and you play your game a bunch of times. And um, kind of, I mean, again, part of the fun of that for play testers, for a designer, like it helps to iterate that even if the game is broken so that you can find all the little bits and pieces where the game is completely uh, falls apart. But as a play tester, it can be kind of fun to just find like, I mean, it's like when you play a video game and you find like find some like element of the game where the graphics are screwed up, or oh, you like fall through the world, or uh, almost just the exploration of that. And oftentimes, a lot of playtesters like they enjoy like finding the yeah. the uh, chinks in the armor, so to speak. Well, I think the other thing about about doing repeated playtests, especially if it's the same group, has anybody um, played the Vlambeer game uh, Loose Trousers that just came out? It's like a so it's great. You should play it. It's totally worth the money. It's a, um, it's kind of like a lunar lander meets asteroids game, right? That's so you're like kind of drifting, and but you you can customize your air your airplane with like different engines and different bodies and different weapons, and they all make the game play. They they all screw with the physics of the game in, in different ways. Um, but unless you put like three or four hours into playing that game, which is a lot of time for a very arcadey style game. You don't, you won't really know like how do I get past this certain threshold of points and and what is my sweet spot in controlling uh, this airplane that I can maximize like how how powerful I am with it. It's the same thing in in board games. Often it doesn't happen in that in that time frame, but um, like. For instance, with Netrunner or Magic or whatever, you play and play and play and play, and you start to realize that some of the things in this game are just red herrings. They're just they're just included to dilute the power of other things, or they're they're included to to counterbalance very specific scenarios and things that seem like total waste are actually really important later on in, in the game. And you just can't get that up front. And then with, oh, so just real quick, uh, going back to Sulkeen really quick, is that there is a certain difficulty with uh, length of game. So if you have a game and you're trying to play test it, and you, you, know, you hit 30 minutes and it's not fun, and then you tell your players, don't worry, just two and a half hours more yeah. of this, <laughs> and we'll, we'll get it figured out. Uh, you've got a much harder row to toe uh, on that, which is actually, you'll find interest. I, I, I think, in part, you'll see a lot more games that are designed for the 45 minute uh, mark because that's usually, I mean, that's the easiest way to iterate a game. Well, that's about the minutes. time, I mean, think about the amount of free time you really have in your life. Well, you know, they, like, they certainly have a lot of different, they're students. <laughs> but even that, I mean, there's kegs to stand on and all that stuff. Um, or I don't know what they do at MIT. Is, is, Matt, is there like I mean, a they have some sort of giant, like, robot yeah. keg? Yeah, you build a robot keg. Um, <laughs> sorry, I have a dime in my tie because I'm a professional. Uh, so <laughs> it's just driving me mad. Uh, oh, that, another important thing about being a designer, develop a mental disorder. That'll really, really help you get the tiny problems like dimes in your tie out. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so half hour, 45 minute games are kind of becoming the thing. As board games have become more and more popular in America, uh, because they were always, well, for the past 25, 30 years, they were very popular in, um, in Europe. And when we're talking about board games, I think the oh, concept, we're not talking about like yeah. traditional games like Monopoly, Scrabble, you know, that kind of early American family 
board game well, night it's games. It's funny because there's so well, there's Scrabble's so, a great game. There's there's so much uh, like when we talk about board games, we talk about they're roughly this big. They got the designer's name on the box. They take between uh, like forty five to three hours, which excludes things like Warhammer. Yeah, uh, and different war games because there's a whole there's a whole other cultures out there, which yeah. is really cool. But like when we say board games, we're talking about that, and again, like. And that's the difference from, uh, say, uh, like I like to use the term tabletop games, but I'll expand that that really far. Um, I, I do the tabletop producing for the Boston Festival of Indie Games, which is coming up in September. That's a huge probably talk about that. This is games, it's like a hockey already. rink, and I'm going to fill it up with indie games. <laughs> I don't know much more than that. We just opened the submissions <laughs> yesterday. It's, it's Johnson. This, this yeah, he's... Johnson, that's going to be sent in this year. You know, kind of um, but one of the thing, one of the differences from last year uh, that that when I came on board, because um, was my first year doing it, I really wanted to stress was that that a tabletop game uh, or an analog game is is something is a different term than a than a board game, right? A board game is very literally something with a board. But a tabletop game, I'll stretch that and say, you know, card games are tabletop games, role playing games are tabletop games. Like you could be playing. The crunchiest, most grognard D and D. Grognard's a term for uh, it's a it's a French term for curmudgeonly uh, old guys, <laughs> right? That's basically it. I think it actually is about generals or something. Um, they're the worst. Uh, <laughs> so uh, so like apples to apples is a tabletop game. Um, uh, what's the game where you're pulling out the sticks and the marbles fall down? Oh, Kerplunk. God, Kerplunk. I love that game. Kerplunk is a tabletop game. Dominoes is a tabletop game. Um, Bocce ball is not a tabletop game, but it's great. Uh, but also, like, you know, if role-playing games are tabletop games, does that mean a LARP is a tabletop game? Because a LARP is just a role-playing game without dice. And if LARPs are tabletop games, then how about, like... I think like, they're uh, technically dexterity games. Oh, uh, well, like, if you're doing Boffer LARP. Oh. But if you're doing something like uh, Nordic LARP, which is a, a brand of live-action role-playing from Norway, Sweden, and Finland... God, th those folks, they go nuts. I was at a convention with those people last, really? last week, and they are hilarious. The, uh, the, the, one, the only one that I know is the, they do, there's a Battlestar Galactica oh, yeah. art, where they actually, they rent out an old, like, battleship, battleship for the weekend. It for a weekend, and yeah, they just, they go and they play this game on, like, out on frigid waters and military bunkers, playing a Battlestar Galactica-themed yeah. Live action role playing. So it is a role playing game, but it's also kind of like a th interactive theater performance. Um, that game was crazy, apparently, uh, because they did. Uh, so is everybody familiar with Battlestar Galactica? Okay, so there's robots and they look like people. So they had it was the Battlestar Galactica, and then they had people who were Cylons, who were agents, and then anyone who was wearing red was a hallucination and could only be seen by specific characters. <laughs> So on the second day of the LARP, and this is like a three-day thing, you freaking sleep on this battleship, and everybody's in character the whole time. On the second day of the LARP, one of the guys who was in red, who was part of the plot as a hallucination, they brought his twin brother in, who nobody else knew that he had a twin brother. So all of a sudden, there's two identical hallucinations wandering around the ship, and everybody's flipping their fucking uh, so, uh, so I guess what I'm saying is that if, if we could rent a battleship for Boston Tech this year, we should look into that. Uh, but like that's, you know, and then like games like Johann Sebastian Joust, which is a digital game, but is it really a digital game? It's really kind of like tag. Oh, I'd even say, uh, uh, what is it, um, Space Team. I don't know if you guys know Space Team at all, iOS game. You play it by, basically you have a user interface and you have to press buttons before a timer runs out. Unfortunately, what buttons you have to press is not on your screen, but on someone else's screen. So they'll tell you to flash the hyperscrew, and you'll look on your thing, and you're like, do I have the hyperscrew to flash? But at the same time, is that a video game? Because there's not really much to it in terms of the digital aspect, so much as that it's a timer, and you have to press buttons at the right time. Like, you make an analog You could make an analog version, version of that. So then to bring this into the, the funding aspect of things, you, you use all these different categories, all these different markets you can think of. Um, how are you exploring that? How are you marketing your games? Like, what are you marketing your games as? What are you? Like, what? What's your? What, well, what's the goal? What well, certainly. Uh, what do I do? What do, uh, you do? Certainly, when we say kind of board games, we mean like again the box about yay big, um, which is in this in this instance I call it the hobby industry. Though there's a lot of 
very nebulous uh, terms of what that falls under. But the hobby industry would, but what is separate from the toy industry, which um, I was actually at Toy Fair yeah. um, in New York, which yeah. is uh, most, mostly, uh, I, mean, I actually just wrote an article uh, on my blog about the difference between a game inventor, a game designer, and a game writer, and how it separates out the different uh, industries that are out there. But uh, for myself personally, uh, our, our kind of industry and where we're hoping that we're seeing the most growth is appealing to people that are mostly on social media, a lot of people that are really into Kickstarter, and very into kind of thematic games that are both themselves uh, thematically interesting as well as the systems that are within them are fair and balanced and are worthwhile to do. Uh, so my strategy is actually to initiate my Kickstarter in about six months. And in that time, I'm going to be creating a transmedia storytelling ad campaign that will take the theme of the game, turn it into sort of a story, and then promote that, uh, as well as talking about just the general design. As a result, hoping to engage social media networks that will then uh, generate the, ad, the needed buzz for when the Kickstarter campaign actually launches. A lot of, a lot of fundraising has less to do with what you're making and more to do with what you can conceivably uh, accomplish in marketing, right? So, so if you have no budget, you have to rely on certain marketing techniques as opposed to others. It's not, a lot of people who have no budget like to think that like, ah, commercials don't work, that's stupid. You know, why would anybody do that as a way of kind of convincing themselves that they've made like a noble choice? No, you just, they just didn't have the money. Sometimes commercials really work. Like for instance, as I was touring on my way down here, um, I relaunched a, a Google AdWords campaign for our game Slash because now I can fulfill orders for it. And, uh, using a m multiple marketing vectors in order to get people interested in your project is really, really important, especially because the means, it's a very competitive space. Um, it is an industry that it's like a, the, the hobby and toy industry was like, 6.1 billion dollars last year, which is not insignificant, but it isn't video games. But unlike video games, it is an industry that has grown 11% um, on average for the year over year for the past five years, and then and before that it was even it was even growing more so than that. No, no, it's, a, it's actually gone up, but it's predicted in 2018 to. I just got University okay. of Texas research. <laughs> I take it real serious. Um, so it's a very fast growing industry because there's space in America for it. It's not as fast growing in Europe because that's already a super saturated market. Um, but stuff like Kickstarter, uh, Patreon, Indiegogo, um, even just going to shows and selling your wares, uh, which is actually really the best way to do it. Um, the way that you get people to come to them is to find the audiences that are that are already keyed into that. They, they like the idea of, I'm helping a person make a thing, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not investing, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like pre-ordering this thing. So you gotta identify what those markets are and find the best ways to get to them and convince them to throw money down a hole called Kickstarter. Because not everything on Kickstarter gets funded uh, and not everything that gets funded on Kickstarter gets done. And then There's some horror many stories. of the things that get funded and get done are crap. Uh, which yeah, is unfortunate. I mean, to riff on that a little bit, uh, like you said, like it's a growing, growing industry. So, like to get into, uh, so the hobby games is a growing industry as opposed to the toy industry. So, if you're trying to get your games to like Hasbro or, I mean, I can say Parker Brothers, but anything else essentially ultimately leads back to Hasbro. Yeah, because Hasbro owns Watsy. Yeah. Um, but anything that you want to get like your game into Toys R Us, that at that point, that industry is pretty static. Yeah. Um, so as as a result, it's very hard to get like known or mentioned or an, a, at all in that. But because the hobby games industry is growing, there's more and more people that are kind of looking for the ground floor. Yeah. And as a result, if you can kind of get your foot in, uh, make a little brand for yourself, get your name out there, then when you actually do start making games, people will recognize you, and you'll be able to kind of uh, market yourself as a brand. Yeah. And again, that's probably one of the most important things that. Um, and the only reason this is possible is because uh, game designers started putting their names on the box. 
Can we talk about designers? So let's talk about like Rainer Nizia, uh, who, one of the most prolific uh, game designers. Not, not all his games are great, but his name is kind of known in the hobby game industry because Dunes designed like 300 games and actually had them all published. Um, and as, as a result, like when you see Rainer Nizia's name on a box, you're going to start to kind of recognize that a little bit. When you're able to generate... I mean, they're not all good. No, they're not all good, but you'll but recognize that, it, that Rainer Nizia, oh, Rainer Nizia, I've heard that name yeah. before. So he cre I mean, he created a brand for himself, just like, um, you know, video game companies do, or, or uh, labels in, in music, but the music industry. You guys weren't <laughs> around in the 90s, so you don't know it exists, um, <laughs> or it used to exist. Uh, yeah, so I think the, the interesting thing about the, the market and ha being able to have that, have that personal brand uh, as a designer is really important because the, the people who are playing uh, board games right now and, and the growing market are, I guess, they're iconoclastic people, they're, you know, they're, hey, we're all individual types, but, you know, they're all, we're really big into geek culture and, and then they, you know, geek culture is bringing 75,000 people here this weekend, so maybe it's not as marginal as we like to think that it is. But it, it, is, a, it is a market that values individuality uh, and individual uh, productivity. So finding the ways to market to those people directly um, can often be really rewarding, especially if you're putting your face on what you're doing. Yeah. Um, uh, another, another example is uh, Daniel Solis. Uh, who's yeah. uh, down in North Carolina? North Carolina. Um, he, for the longest time, I mean, he was a graphic graphic designer, but he started as sort of a, a board game blog uh, that uh, he just talks about uh, sort of his expertise in designing a lot of games. He's just he's a very prolific guy, um, and he does a lot of stuff that's just completely open source, print and play games. But uh, as he's he actually, I I so. He works out of his house like I do, and we're, we actually do a conference call every morning with a number of other designers. I was wondering how you knew him. Uh, yeah, and he just released a, if you guys ever watch Firefly, that show? So he just did the layout for, like his normal job is doing uh, graphic design and layout. Where did you have your son? And so, <laughs> uh, so he just laid out the Firefly RPG, which is available um, for download now as a PDF and then, and then they're um, releasing it later. But that's, so he does that and then he has this whole, I'm gonna make games a lot and put them up on uh, drive through cards, which is an online service that allows you to do print on demand, which is another one of the things that in the past year has kind of really shaken up uh, the, the, the board game industry. Um, you know, you used to not be able to get anything done unless you're gonna do 3,000 copies of it. But now I can make a game, put it up on drive-thru cards, and then you could go spend 10 bucks and download it. Or you, they would actually send you like an individually printed thing. <laughs> uh, but again, some of the, some of the, the clever bit is about, so Daniel Solis, he's doing all this sort of stuff, uh, just sort of uh, presenting himself as an expert, creating a uh, brand of himself. I actually I brought him up to PAX last year uh, as, an, as an expert, but uh, he, I guess about six months ago, ran a Kickstarter for Bell of the Ball, um, and he leveraged uh, some of his, some of his connections. Um, and the game itself is is very good, but the Kickstarter was wildly successful. I think he got something like three times what he asked for, just in terms of um, uh, kickstarting the game. And as as a result, I believe a lot of his connections and leveraging his brand as an expert. Um, I think at some point he's got, I think, 5,000 Twitter followers, a decent um, blog presence. And as a result, uh, having that before he launches a Kickstarter or sort of starts to generate um, pre-sales for a board game, that he's going to do much better. Um, and at the effort that he puts into it is really just uh, talking about board games, putting information for free online, and establishing himself as someone who's an expert. So. All these crowdfunding models, I mean, there is a little bit of precedent in the publisher-run era, but mm -hmm. groups like GMT, but for the most part, they're fairly recent developments mm -hmm. because of people being willing to give money online. I'm assuming that your interactions are mostly with the end buyer, the person who's actually going to end up playing the game. But where does this leave the role of stores, like, ah. you know, especially hobbyist stores? 
I, I do also work at a, uh, games, a game store, Eureka Puzzles, again, uh, down in Brookline. Um, and that's, a, that's an interesting uh, function as well. Uh, if you do a little bit of res research in general, uh, retail stores, not just board game stores, but anywhere that sells things, uh, is sort of taking a nosedive as uh, an industry, which is kind of hard to imagine just stores selling things as an industry. But the idea is that with the internet, um, and particularly with like Amazon Prime, uh, oftentimes you can find the same product online, and even with shipping, uh, they can uh, beat the price of any retail store, uh, which hits board games, board game retail outlets uh, pretty hard because you can go in hell. I work at Eureka Puzzles; I get an employee discount, uh, and it's still cheaper for me to go on Fun Again Games and buy uh, a game on that and. With shipping, it's still cheaper than what I pay uh, at Eureka Puzzles for a board game. Yeah. Uh, as a result, a lot of retail outlets are starting to realize that if they're going to survive, they can't uh, do it by trying to beat price with online stores. So yeah, as, turn a, it down. Sorry. as a result, they're uh, realizing that uh, their strength is that they have a physical presence. Um, so their idea is that if they're going to charge more for board games than you can get online, that they need to add value to that. Um, well, that's why you see stuff like the Night Moves Cafe, exactly. where they're taking that. So the, the interesting thing about this, well, I, well, one of the interesting things about this is um, comic books, right? So comic books in the 90s were huge, and then they went through this bust, and uh, the people who own comic book stores started to see the margins on their products get shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and less and less and less people buying comics, right? So it's a really dire situation. Um, and in the past 10 years, it's become really easy to pirate comics online. Uh, but more so than that, uh, there are apps for your phone or your iPad, like Comixology or the Marvel app, that actually do a really, really good job of presenting comics to you. Like, uh, my wife wouldn't read comics at all before just because sometimes people who don't really know how to do layout end up doing layout for comics and so it can be literally it can be confusing to read just because they don't have artistic mastery of how to make someone's eye flow across the page one of the things that like comiXology app does is that you can just zoom in panel to panel to panel to panel to panel to panel and it's, it's a surprising shift in the way that you read comics anyway the important thing is that comic stores were getting a lot less money and so what they did is they took all their floor space and started to dive heavier into the parts of their business that were generating the money, which was board games uh, and hobby games. Um, and they, the ones that survived, because a lot of them have gone out of business, the ones that survived tend to be really, really good. And the reason that they're re really good is because they realize that they're not in the business of selling you comics. They're in the business of creating a community, right? And you go and buy, com like I drive an hour to my comic store because I'm an idiot. Uh, <laughs> I, I, and I could just be buying them online. I drive an hour to, my, to my comic store because they have a, they're good operators creating a good community for people to come together and you know talk about different projects. They're always like running events like this. It's barely a store. It's like a little mini convention that's always kind of slightly happening. Um, and so. A large part of that is realizing, you know, we can get people in this store for a longer period of time if we're all playing games together, if we're running card game tournaments and, and board yeah. game tournaments. But then the, the interesting part is how do, how do we as designers uh, take that? What's their, what's their role to us? And it's, I mean, before it was definitely, you could, uh, if you get your game picked up by a distributor or to a publisher and the publisher gets it picked up by a distributor and all of a sudden you're not selling to a direct audience online, you're, sen you're selling to hundreds of thousands of little mom and pop stores across the nation, your numbers are huge. But now, you, but can, you can still You can still wind up making a lot less. True, because uh, your margins are going to be. Because your margins are worse. So. But the, uh, the part of the thing that you can do now is that board game stores can really help with the promotion of your game. Yeah. Um, I know like Eureka Puzzles, Night Moves are huge on like, if you've got a game that you want to show people, that you can come in and teach it to a bunch of people at their store, they happy to do that because on the one hand, um, you're adding value to their store, which they love and need. Um, so that people will like, oh, you're good puzzles. They had that one guy come in and that was really cool. I learned how he made this game. But then you're getting value out of that that now people know about your game. 
And then when a store buys games from you, you still get the sort of, maybe not necessarily the margins you need, but, you know. It's still a lot better. Um, so like normally, it, in traditional publishing, if I was going to put out a board game 20 years ago, 15 years ago, I would have to find a distributor like Alliance or Diamond or something. And then I would sell my game to them for 20% of the MSRP, which is the manufacturer's suggested retail price. So if I had a game that was $25, I would sell it to the distributor for, uh, I would sell it to the distributor for $5. And then he would turn around and sell it to a store for somewhere in between that $5 and half the MSRP. Um, and that's his cut. And then in between, there's all these other people who are taking their cut and taking their cut and taking their cut. And the reason that I've made jokes about the music industry model from the 90s is because it's the same fucking model. It's the same thing. It's that there are people who are creating stuff, but because there is no really awesome way for them to get it directly to the people who care about it, and they have to go through all these weird side projects, uh, um, side industries or middleman industries, uh, they only a few people who are tapped by very, very powerful companies got to be famous in the 90s. Um, and then, you know, the internet came and destroyed all of music, even though music's making more than it ever has and all these other things. But what was rediscovered in that shift, and this is something that's happening in board games right now, um, is that people want the direct audience to creator connection. You know, like if you if you could spend twenty dollars on a CD because they used to be twenty dollars, uh, or twenty dollars on a ticket to go see a show, even though you're not a, of like a band that you enjoy, even though you don't get to keep that show forever, that's come on, that's so much more enjoyable. You know, because you could get that CD in a million different ways from a million different locations, or like it's really easy. But you're getting an experience with with the other thing, um, and you're getting to know that you're directly supporting the creator, which is something that a lot of audience members are really invested in. And as someone who is a creator, I'm very invested in that. <laughs> um, but also it's financially beneficial. So like for me, for instance, um, I can make a short run print product for like $3 and sell it for 20 bucks and then you know cook the mailing uh, price into that and get someone I've actually made a reasonably good profit on it but if I make it for three bucks and want to sell it for 20 bucks I kind of end up having to sell it to a distributor still for like four or five bucks and then in order for it to be worth my time I really need to make a whole lot of them and the distributors probably only want want it if I can make a whole lot of them so now I gotta find a way to make a thousand of this thing which in board games is a ridiculous number of a game to have. Like, unbelievable, unbelievably large number. Yeah, but like unfortunately, you can't get it affordable unless it's above that number. Right, and that's the, the part of the funny thing, too. Is like, you, like, you think about like self-publishing and stuff, and you're like, all right, well, like, okay, to make it, I need to make a thousand copies. And you, you, you have like a decent budget, and you kind of figure out, and you're like, all right, that's fine. But then when you, when you think, like, okay, I'm just going to keep those in my house until uh, I sell them all. You don't realize how many, like, how much space a thousand board games takes up until you see it. Oh, actually, I have a video because I have twenty five hundred. <laughs> I have twenty five hundred in my garage right now, and it takes up exactly a car's worth. <laughs> so if you have, have twenty five hundred copies, at twenty five thousand. <laughs> <laughs> is this a card game? Is this? A it's a card oh. game. It is this card game. Wow. <laughs> Um, and I got 2,500 of them in my garage, and then some more of them down at the port for we should, we should bring up their, their I don't think you, you'd ever say this, there is some benefit to going through traditional publishing and... Yeah, publishing. it's right for some people, it's not right for... And I mean, the reason I would suggest that is that if you get a really good game idea, and you pitch it to a publisher, and they really like it, which... It's, there's so much more to to that than just being like, take this game. They're like, we love your game. We'll, yeah. we'll take it. And here's the money. <laughs> but the Forever. Idea is that if, if you create an idea and you sell it to a, a publisher, you're done. Yeah. And it's not they, your a, and it's not your idea anymore. And it's not your idea anymore. But uh, the, all of a sudden, with the self-publishing, it becomes like, I mean, the amount of effort to to make a game fly is huge. Yeah. It's massive, especially if you're doing it on your own. But if um, you sell it to a publisher, you're not going to make as much money. But at the, there comes a point where you're not doing anything and you're still getting paid for yeah, it. Yeah, it's 100% of a small number or 5% of a big number. Yeah. And, and 
it's a question of what are you in it for, right? And and what is your what does your time look like? Um, like for me, I make games, uh, and I chose to leave a life that was not making me happy, but was making me lots of money, for a life that is making me significantly less money, but uh, is still make is making me really happy because I get to create things and they're fun, and I get to like a really happy person. It's, it's the medication. Um, <laughs> uh, also, if, you know, I'm not. I don't work in an office so well. Uh, so, it fulfills that kind, that that artistic or, or or productive drive, and that's not something to to be ignored. Um, totally lost my train of thought. Yeah, that's. I, but I think I, again, like the major the major point is that if you want to make your career making games, doing it yourself can be really big. If you want to like put a few games out there and do a lot of other things with your life, like just uh, like once a month sending out all of your games to every publisher you got the email for, uh, now you can just kind of you don't have to make it your life. Yeah, it's like it's like if you were going to start a band. Is the band your life, or is it what you do, you know, for fun with some of your friends? Like, it, it, neither neither is an illegitimate way of doing it. They're just right for different people. I can do that. I can do that. If self publishing is kind of an undertaking that develops skill and contacts and experience mm -hmm. to sort of get down the learning curve, so to speak, and you guys have your finger on the pulse of the community and you know a lot of like up and coming designers that may not have that sort of skill set, um, have you considered publishing other people's games? Um. I, ha I have considered it and I've been approached to do it, but I've said n no to it because I don't, I worked in publishing for a long time and I, I am ideologically opposed to that model. Um, that being said, one of the things that I do, uh, I do this on a consulting basis and I also do this just through um, my, my, you know, our website and kind of the fact that all of our games are Creative Commons licensed and the whole process and Frank, can you turn that down? Is um, teach people how to do it. Because it is an undertaking, but it's nowhere near as hard as you would think. Um, uh, you just, you know, just the kind of effort you would put into studying for a class is the kind of effort you need to put in to figure out how to deal with Amazon, uh, you know, fulfillment services. Or what does it take to, oh God, figuring out shipping. <laughs> if you ever start a Kickstarter, for anything, figure out the damn shipping. That will kill you. I had um, a friend of mine who made this really cool game called um, Mobile Frame Zero Rapid Attack, which is a which is a robot fighting game that you, where you make all the Lego you make Lego robots. And anyway, oh yeah, from the indie yeah. So they're doing and his, his, his demo is new on this weekend, which is oh, like cool. a rockets in space or something. Anyway, so he he raised like eighty five thousand dollars on Kickstarter to publish what was just a book and mail it to people, but because he had not, and he's a smart person, because he had not figured out the shipping costs, he ended up 25 grand in the hole. Yeah, yeah, because he didn't go to the United States Postal Service and go, what are your rates? Yeah. So, <laughs> so, like, so, so 85,000, it, it cost him roughly 100,000 100, yeah. to make it. So like, th it's not just, like if that's, that is what a publisher does for you. They, they go, don't even freaking worry about it. We're taking 90% of whatever this game makes, 95% of whatever this game makes, but you don't have to worry about any of that crap. Um, and so for some people that's really and then What you're actually finding a lot of is that there's tons of small publishers, and these are actually starting, I mean, Game Salute is one, yeah. uh, Mayday game, yeah, I don't like that one as much. Anyway, uh, Mayday games, they do like my neighbor. Bitch, uh, which you might have seen on Tabletop. Yeah, that's uh, Dave Chalker. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he's a really good guy. But um, lots of small companies that they, it was a designer, he had one game, he's like, I'm going to do it my, myself and try and make this work. Mm -hmm. uh, Tasty Minstrel's another one. There's a lot of these little... Mm -hmm. Dice Hate Me games just started like that. Yeah. And now they have Where a whole convention. Uh, uh, they start with an idea, they do it themselves, and hey, it works out. And then from there, they realize, hey, we should do a lot more of these, because that was successful, and if we're successful at it, we can make it work. And after uh, the one designer kind of takes and builds a company, it becomes three or four people, and it becomes mildly successful, um, and they've 
pushed out all the games that they thought like, man, you know, I've, I've made all the games that I wanted to setting out. Or they've used all their hours in the day and they just can't do anymore. Well, then, then, they, they, then once that happens, um, a lot of publishers will then start to look for other designers and publish their games. Because after, you know, you know you're, you're designing your games, you've got your, like, your A idea, your B idea, and your C idea, and you're like, these are all great. And once you've published all of those, you start to realize maybe those other ideas that you have are good, but maybe you'd be better, uh, uh, more successful if you could pick out some other ideas that other people have submitted to you. And be like, that's actually better than what I would do myself. Or so maybe a lot of times what will happen is, is as a designer, you, you, do, you have a lot of ideas, and, and if you're a smart designer, you realize that mm, most of them are probably not good. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. That's the nation. Nothing springs forth from someone's head like Athena, perfectly formed. It just that is not how things are made, right? You just all your favorite musicians practiced forever to get really good. It's just the way it is. And in, in game design, it's the same. We have to make a lot of really crap. There's a really good uh, phrase about writing, which is that every writer has two thousand bad pages in them, and the good writers are the ones who got the two thousand out somewhere else. So, um, you know, you, you got to keep that in mind. But I think that the, the ability to find publishers is, is not diminishing, but the ability to self-publish is rising, especially although we have great self-publishing uh, uh, tools now, uh, and the Internet's really good for sharing things. The, the biggest thing that's happened in, in the past year and going into this year is um, uh, 3D printing. So while, we, while we've kind of hit the end of what self-publishing is, we're just beginning to see what desktop manufacturing is. Like people who are just running their own little factories in their houses, which is a super cool. I'm actually doing that for my game. Yeah, that's so cool. I really want to do that so much. Um, so I think for another question. Like yeah. what, what does your supply chain look like? Do you have domestic or regional? It depends on the depends on the scale. Yes, this was printed in China. Like I said, just got off the boat. Just been made in China. Um, so I uh, worked with a printer on this, um, and you know, like uh, because I'd been doing printing and publishing for for so long, like I know the jargon and know the lingo. Again, another thing that a publisher can be really good for is that. You, you don't need to study to figure out all the things, right? Like, they maybe have made all those mistakes in the past for you. Um, you, don't need, you don't need to screw up your bleed lines. And yeah. The or cards and all of the, they're all offset. If you've got the expertise or you can organize the expertise amongst the people you know, you, you can get past a lot of it. But, but these, but think about it. Like, everyone who's printing stuff or making things, they want you to use their services, right? Because they're a service industry. They're gonna make it as easy as possible. And if they don't make it easy, there's someone f like four blocks down that is probably gonna do it because that, yay, capitalism. Um, there is, you know, there's, God, I think one of the pitch like buy a printer or it, No, it is. It's actually a huge expense to buy a printer. The problem with printers is that they're super expensive to have and not use. So people are. It's better to have the machine running. And break oh yeah, than you want that machine running, losing money, because you'll lose less money than if it wasn't running at all. So um, there are there are a decent number of American manufacturers, uh, certainly for mm -hmm. like prototype level uh, materials. And in Massachusetts, right? Like yeah. Toronto's in Massachusetts. Uh, specifically Massachusetts, there there's a lot of stuff. Um, I, I would I would say is from what I've heard, nothing will beat China in terms of. Uh, cost. It depends on the it depends on the exact scope of your project and the number of units that you're doing. So, like, on a, if you're doing a few units of a very complicated thing, you could actually probably get good prices in America. If you're doing a lot of units of something relatively simple, you, you're right, you can't beat it. Right, and then there's oftentimes like some people will do piecemeal, so they go to some printers for some things yep. like the boxes, the rule books, and you kind of pull that together, and that can be. A nightmare. It can be, uh, and but there are specifically services that you can hire. Uh, they're called like pick and pack uh, warehouses, where let's say I had a board game and it had components coming from the four corners of the earth. Um, I could get them all shipped to one place and then pay a person a quarter per unit to pack it all together and whatever. And if I have filled out my spreadsheet correctly, I will realize whether that is a financially viable 
thing or not. In the case of this where I had, um, so one of the things I like about self-manufacturing is that I can figure that stuff out as I'm doing it. So for instance, uh, on early prototypes of Slash, um, I was printing all the cards and cutting all the cards and, and, and killing myself because it's a lot of cards to cut. And so it kind of bakes back into the design like, okay, well, if I change the size of the cards, I can use this machine to cut it and it's going to save me like a half hour on every single unit. Okay, that's and then a, that's a whole other thing is yeah. design around like components. your physical capabilities. Which is what you'll actually see the rise of uh, like super small games, like micro games. Micro games because they take a lot less to make. Yeah, the the biggest game you can create using uh, ten wooden chips and a miniature dice and fit into a package about this big. Yeah. So there's that that like threshold, but so so one of the things I had with this is that um when you do printing you you, you usually have like one big let's say for cards one big piece of paper with a bunch of different cards on it and then you cut it all out now if i'm making 24 copies of the game it just so happens that i can fit 24 cards on one sheet of paper which means instead of printing card a b c d e f g h i j k l m n o p q r s whatever on that one page and then cutting it out and then sorting it i can print a 24 times and then do that 400 times in a row, stack them all together, chop it, 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 and I don't have to sort anything anymore. I just, like, I have cut hours off of that pick and pack time, and now multiply it by the number that I just got out of it. Instead of making one game every half hour, I'm making 12 games every 15 minutes or something. And, and then, uh, I just want to go back again to, sure. to, to China versus the States as well, is that um, I'm finding a lot of Kickstarters uh, realize that the margins that they need uh, for like small amounts, like they have to go to China if they're going to make any, like if they're going to even break even. But that if they exceed goals or go uh, much higher and they can do larger quantities produced in the states, then they can get the same margins. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people will, uh, if they can get a game big enough, will try and uh, as sort of a stretch goal, yeah. uh, bring games to the, the United States if they can sell enough of them. And those are the, that's, this is a challenge that is unique to analog games, obviously. Like, you don't need to worry about where you're getting your cards cut for, I guess, unless you're making, like, some kind of Pokemon AR game. That would be super cool. <laughs> anyway, I guess... How do they not have that? They've got to have that, right? Yeah, they have to. Do they actually, like, interact with each other? They should. Because I, I saw, last year they did a Kickstarter for uh, Golem Arcana which is like an app and a miniatures war game where like your, your dude has a QR code on it and then like it uses the app to do all the combat. There's a long tradition of Japanese arcade games that make cards, barcodes mostly. Uh, oh God, yeah, yeah. I remember the that. Mario Kart games are yeah. great, I got one. Yeah. Great, that's, that's our time for, for today with them. Sure. Yeah. Uh, do we have time to play? Yeah, yeah, we've got two hours to play. We're gonna play, so yeah. thanks for coming. And, sure. uh, everyone, thanks. Thanks again for having us. Thank you for having us. So we're going to spend the last um, two hours of class. Well, first we're going to take a break, um, check in with y'all. Did, did you do that already about uh, teams? Yeah, so we'll check in with y'all to see how you, if you've um, formed into teams yet for the next uh, project. And then we're going to be playing, um, you got a couple of your games? I brought, I think, eight different games that I've made. Cool, great. So we're going to play some of those games, and we're also going to play, um, we've got three games that are related to the assignment um, that John will be talking to us about. Also, I guess if anyone's interested, I'm going to go ahead and leave some of my business cards up here. Uh, as I kind of go through the process of uh, making my game through Kickstarter, I'm basically going to be posting my experiences uh, every step of the way uh, from design to manufacture. So if you want to watch someone struggle immensely through the process uh, and watch the mistakes that I make and laugh immensely, because it's going to be hilarious, um, feel free to grab a business card. Uh, and if you're, into, if you're interested in playing croquet and also murdering each other, uh, this is definitely uh, the game for that. Throw this up here. And so just to show you guys, these are the three phases of prototypes. Oh, this is, these are the two phases of prototypes that I went through. Is that a VHS, VHS cassette? cassette? Yeah, and so here's the trick. The reason that it's in a VHS cassette is um, because this will fit into the smallest flat rate uh, priority mailer. Wait, really? I can get any game that fits in this size anywhere in America for five bucks in two days. You just, and you can't beat that. And so if I wanted to get a lot of these games out and not 
get a second mortgage out of my house because I'm not an idiot. Um, I designed that. So I actually do that with all of my <laughs> monthly games. And, and the cases are probably... Cases like are dirt cheap. They're like eight cents each. You have to have the yeah. I've got, yeah, no one needs them. Yeah, so and I found a place that is still selling them. So, you know, supply chain stuff. Sweet. Anyway. Um, uh, so, while we take this break, let's just say 10 minutes. Uh, let's, put, let's put the table together so that we can actually uh, uh, get, get Did you bring uh, the water again? The what? The No, I did not because the. Um, I don't know, wait, maybe I did. Uh, my artist is is supposed to be getting it to me today. Uh, the the really oh, great. Thank you. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Thanks for coming, guys. That what are you awesome. guys doing? Oh. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, it was great. Yeah.